Welcome to the Champions Church podcast. We're so glad that you could join us today. We pray that as you listen to this message, you would encounter God in a powerful way and that you will be encouraged and inspired. Thank you so much. You know, great churches just don't happen. I want to honor your pastors, Pastor Mark and Pastor Jillian. Come on, can we thank, thank, thank God? What great pastors. So amazing. You know, people just think, well, how does this happen? You don't just get a great building like this and presence of God like this. Come on. How many are part of the vision that, that we're opening up a new, come on, kids wing over there? We're, we're going to be a part of that. So right afterwards, I know a lot of guest speakers go to the green room. We're going to go to the vision board. And we're going to look and we're going to say, God, what do you want us to, to be a part of here? Do you know what I've learned? If you make somebody else's dream come true, come on, God will make your dream come true. You got to be a part of what God's doing here, right? It's amazing. I'm glad that you're here. Maybe you're a guest with us. And, and please don't judge this church based on what I'm going to do today. Come back next week. Come on here, Pastor, right? And so I just want to thank you. Thank you again for having us. We're from Las Vegas, Nevada. And, um, you know, we have a great church, Church LV, and we have three kids at home. Uh, We have an 18-year-old son, Uh, we have a 14-year-old daughter, BJ Bella, and then our 10-year-old, he's just crazy, his name is Benaya, he's a wild guy, and we're glad to be here. For the sake of just getting up front, because people always ask me afterwards what my nationality is, and they, they, they guess all kinds of stuff, you know, from Middle Eastern to Greek to to Italian, never been, never been uh, mistaken for African American yet, but you never know. Uh, I keep laying out. I'm getting darker. Praise the Lord. Amen. But I'm actually Hispanic. I'm Mexican-American, and uh, my wife is white, like really white, white. Like she's English white because she's English, and, and so our kids are coconuts. They're half white. Come on. Coconut brown on the outside. White. Okay, it's a tough crowd. All right. Let's just get in the Bible. That, that'll save all of us. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 6, and you're the smart service. Somebody say, I'm the smart service. Because I have to end on time. The next one, there is no other service. So we may go to about 6 o'clock tonight. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 25. And uh, I believe we're reading out the NIV translation. So I'll turn around because I have a different translation. Here's Jesus speaking. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not what? He said, do not worry about your what? About your life. What do you eat or drink or what? Uh, drink or about your body, what you wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds. Somebody say, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Who's who's heavenly Father? Somebody say, mine. Somebody say it stronger. Say, mine. Say, my heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Jesus goes on to say, can you, can any of you, by worrying, can any single hour to your life? He says, and why do you worry about clothes, right? Now, now, listen, I, I like fashion, okay? If I was in America, I'd say, are they Target? Come on, a Nordstrom. Some of you will get it later. <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Verse 30, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Come on, you're you a little faith, right? So do not worry. Somebody say, do not worry. Come on, say it louder. Say, do not worry. Why do you say it with an accent? No, no, no. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Come on, is it Nando's? I love Nando's. Come on, don't hate now. Don't hate. All right, you want to make me happy, just take me to Nando's. That's all I have to eat when I'm in England. All, I'll eat Nando's all day long. So, so what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Is it Coke or Pepsi? Or what shall we wear? Verse 32, for the pagans, the unbelievers run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need of them. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? His righteousness, not yours. And all these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34, therefore, because everything I've said, do not worry about tomorrow. And anybody speak Spanish? Do not worry about mañana. For tomorrow we'll worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 If you're taking notes, because I believe you should take notes, uh, not just because I'm preaching, but uh, if you take notes and and, uh, if you are into 
uh, success motivation, peak performance coaching, they would tell you that you will retain a small amount of what you hear just by sitting there and listening. That's good. But they also have told us that if you respond, if, like, yeah, like if you say, yeah, or yeah, uh-huh, yeah, go ahead, preach it, you know, wh whatever. If you respond, your, 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 your percentage of retaining actually goes even higher. But they've recently told us that if you not only listen, respond, but take notes, you will retain up to 90% of what you hear. See, so, so I'm glad that you're sitting here, but you're not designed just to sit here to take up space. You came to this planet, come on, to make a difference. That God has a great plan for your life. That God is for you. Come on, not against you. I want to talk to you very briefly on the topic. If you want to take notes, you should take notes. Because if you take notes, as I said, you're going to retain more. If you want to take notes, it's, it's my dad's got it. Write down that title, my dad's got it. My dad, my dad's got it. My dad's got it. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. I'm one of five kids. And my parents divorced when I was six. And my mom remarried when, when uh, I was eight years old. And my stepdad is really my dad because he raised me most of my life. And one thing I love about my stepdad, my dad was the kind of guy, still is the kind of guy that if he said something, come on, we know it was going to happen. My dad just got it. My dad, my dad was smart. He's beginning to date my mom because four kids, you know, that she had already weren't his own. And, and he, he used to always bring over some ice cream. And, in fact, this, this flavor called Rocky Road ice cream, and it's still my favorite ice cream. And uh, he'd always come because he knew that we needed a distraction. Come on. My mom would always tell him, well, okay, I got four kids. What are you going to do? She, he says, I got it. I'll take care of it. And so he'd come up, come up with all this ice cream. And that's all we cared. I mean, listen, he, he won me over just by bringing ice cream. Come on. And to this day, I, if I ever get stressed out a little bit, come on, I got to get some Rocky Road ice cream. Right? Because my dad's got it. My, dad's, my dad taught me how to golf, and he got me my first golf clubs. My dad's got it. My, my dad let me drive the golf cart. Come on. There's something like when you're 10 years old, driving the golf cart, you're just feeling like you're, you're the big man on the golf course, right? Until I ran him over. True story. <laughs> but, but I learned that my dad's got it. My dad would say, we're going to go to Disneyland. And, and I said, okay. And my dad said, come on, my dad's going to do it. Now, maybe some of you don't, didn't have a good father growing up like, like I had a good father growing up, like Wendy had a great father growing up. Maybe you didn't have a good household. Maybe there were some challenges in your life. But I got good news for you. Even if you didn't have a good earthly father, you still have a great heavenly father, right? And, and before this message is over, you could begin to say, you know what, my heavenly father, come on, my dad's got it. In the background that we read in Matthew chapter 6, very interesting, that we read this, and, and you have to back up a few chapters to understand what is happening. Jesus, earlier in the book of Matthew, Jesus now is water baptized, and the heavens open, and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's just interesting to know that Jesus had not done any miracle, did not walk on water, did not cast any demons out, had not preached a message, had done anything to deserve the Father's love. The Father declares that I love him before he does anything. Because this is how God works. It's not because you have to work for God's love. God's love is given to you. Everything is by God's grace. Somebody say grace. So what happens is, is now he receives this affirmation from his father, Jesus does, and he goes into the wilderness and he is tempted by the enemy. If you find yourself being tempted, may, let me make it clear. The Bible says that if you're tempted, it's because of your own earthly desires or it is of the, the devil. God does not tempt anyone. He cannot tempt you. He cannot tempt me. And so Jesus now goes into the wilderness, a wild wilderness, and the enemy tempts him with the same three temptations that the first Adam in the garden had he had to face. And yet the first Adam in the garden, in a perfect garden, failed. But Jesus in a wild wilderness overcame the, the, the same three temptations that the first Adam did not overcome. Now, a lot of people say this. Well, this is because he was Jesus. And, of course, he was Jesus. But Jesus lived on this planet just like me and you. Although he was 100% God, 100% man, he did not overcome the enemy in his divinity. He overcame in his humanity. Now, why is that significant? Because if you think that Jesus did everything by his divinity, then you say that was Jesus. But the Bible says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So how did Jesus overcome the enemy in a wild wilderness? The same way me and you have to overcome the same thing. We overcome by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. Every time the enemy came, he said, no, 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 devil, it is written. It is written. It is. That's why it's not enough just to hear the Word. Come on, we need to take in the Word of God. 
She said, well, I don't know all the Bible, but the Bible you know is usually enough. See, sometimes, oh, I don't know that much, but what you do know is a weapon. What you do know, come on, by God's grace can help you overcome. So if you understand now, Jesus comes out. I'm trying to paint this picture. He comes out of the wilderness, and, and he comes out in power, starts healing the sick, casting out devils, doing all kinds of awesome stuff. And then the Bible says that he calls out these 12 men to follow him. They are called the 12 disciples. And sometimes we think that they are the perfect 12. But I would say that the dirty dozen. I don't know where we got this. Understand, I'm from Las Vegas. We're not religious. I'm not from Charlotte. I'm not from Dallas. I'm not from the Bible Belt. I am from what the world calls Sin City. Okay, so we're not a religious city. To build a church in Las Vegas is different than building a church in the Bible Belt in America. Okay, so, so, so if I'm a little bit out there, it's because I'm from Las Vegas. Has anybody been in Las Vegas? It's not a sin. You can raise your hand. Thank you so much. So what Jesus does is he picks the dirty dozen. Guys like Peter, after three and a half years, still didn't get it, denies Jesus, curses Jesus, takes out a sword, chops off a guy's ear. He's so bad he can't even hit him in the head. He barely gets his ear. Come on, Peter. If you're going to do something, do it right. I'm just saying right now. Right, and this is the same guy that after the day of Pentecost that God calls him to preach the first message and over 3,000 people get saved. You feel like maybe somebody sitting here right now is like, I'm not good enough. No, none of us are good enough to follow God. None, listen, none of us were good enough that God said, okay, you're good enough, Benny Perez, now I'm going to choose you. Listen, the Bible says we didn't choose God. Come on, God chose us. That God is so good in his grace and his mercy that he chooses you in spite of yourself. Oh, this is good preaching right now. I'm going to amen myself. So he picks the dirty dozen, not the perfect 12. And so the Bible says that he calls these men and he calls them up to the mountain. God always calls us up. He always calls us higher. Can I tell you, for Champions Church, your best years are not behind you. Your best years are ahead of you. Come on, God is calling us higher. God is calling our church. You say, our church? Yeah, because I'm here. I'm under his authority. This is my church. And I'm here to tell you, Champions Church, get ready because you're going to go higher. You're going to reach more, do more, have more influence, not just in this city, but in this nation. He calls them up. And it's interesting that we begin to see the teaching of Jesus. He begins to talk to them about, you know, that didn't come to uh, 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 do away with the law, but fulfill the law. He talks to them about anger. He talks to them about lust. He talks to them about marriage. He talks to them about keeping your word. He talks to them about retaliation. I don't like that one. He talks to them about loving your enemies. I'm going to skip that one too. Yeah. He talks to them about all these things, about giving to the needy, how to pray. He talks to them about fasting. No, no, thank you. I like to eat. He talks to them about laying up treasures in heaven and what it means that, that watch, that money should not control you, but you should control money. I get tired of religion that, that, that paints poverty as the ultimate, you know, of following God. Listen to me. Poverty is not of God. Because it, it listen, well, well I, you know, just poor people know God better. Well, listen, no, no, no. Wealthy people can know him too. See, religion tries to pervert everything, right? So, so, so he begins to talk about what money is and the purpose of money and the purpose of wealth and the purpose of riches. And then he gets to verse 25 when he says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. The word therefore means because of everything that I have told you prior to this one statement. So you have to go back and you have to actually read about two or three chapters and begin to understand what Jesus is saying. He says, therefore, don't worry or don't be anxious. Now, why is he telling us that? Why is he telling his followers, which is me and you, and if you're not a follower, you will become one in about 23 minutes. Well, why is Jesus telling us? Because our natural tendency is to worry. Come on, let's be honest. Our natural tendency is to have anxiety. That that's the natural order of things. We live in a world that at least in America has accepted worry and anxiety as something that is normal. But, but I want you to hear me when I say this. Just because it is natural does not mean it, it must become normal in your life. You need to write that. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it has to become normal. And, and, and we, have to, we have to begin 
to, to understand what culture is trying to do. And, and, and in America, we have com- uh, comedians that get up and, and, and make fun of anxiety and worry. And, and it's like, oh, it's, 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 it's natural, so it should be normal. But just because it's natural doesn't mean it has to become normal in your life. What is anxiety? What is worry? The inner feeling of being torn apart because of circumstances outside of your control. Just think about this definition. I'm worried having anxiety over things I have no control over. Like for reals. Like really? I didn't have any anxiety about, oh, what what shoes am I going to wear? Because I have control over those. But it's only things we have no control over. And the enemy comes and he tries to get you in a place of worry and anxiety when you don't have control over it anyway. The word anxiety means to be torn, to be pulled apart in different directions. It means to be torn apart in the inside. And how many of us, whether you live in the UK or America or around the world, are dealing with anxiety and worry? <laughs> it's so funny. People say, well, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't deal with anxiety. I'm just really concerned. About my kids. I, I, I don't deal with anxiety or worry. I'm just really concerned about the future. Pastor, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really uh, uh, dealing with anxiety or worry. I'm just really concerned that this year is not going to re- be a repeat of last year. You see, I understand that because I used to live that way in my life. I was so concerned about everything being right, I missed out on getting one thing right in my life. I fell into the trap, listen, champions, of, of getting all the things right on the outside, hoping it would make it make my life right, getting the right job, getting the right girl, getting the right education, getting the right car, getting the right look, getting the right friends, getting everything right because I was con- trying to control things I could not really control. See, worry and anxiety, if we're honest, it's an emotion that, we, that is based on what we perceive, what we see. It is usually not based on reality. Is based on what we think is going to happen. Now, I, I used to read this text, and, and I've been preaching for a little while now, and, and I used to preach it where Jesus said, don't worry. And it's like, if we ever felt worry or anxiety, then, then I would feel condemned because Jesus says, don't worry. Don't be anxious. But as I began to study this out, and I was praying, and I, I really felt that, like this was from the Lord, and, and, and I need to drop this on somebody here. Jesus did not say, don't feel it. He said, don't be it. Say that again. Jesus didn't say, don't feel it. He said, don't become it. Come on, don't be it. Why? Because you are not your emotions or your feelings. Are you hearing me? They are fickle. They are subject to change. Your emotions can be impacted by the food you eat. You eat the wrong food, blood sugar goes up, blood sugar comes down. No wonder you're so moody. You know your emotions could be affected by not seeing the sun. Come on, UK. That's why you're all happy. You've been seeing the sun. Like, this happened since 1975. You know what I'm saying? That's all I keep hearing in the UK. I, I land, everybody's like, hey, hey. I'm like, this is not the UK I'm used to. Like, why is everybody happy? Is there, is there an illegal drug going around? What's going on with this? No, I mean, no, everybody's like smiling, and the Uber driver picks me up. He's smiling, and, and it's like, yeah. I go, wow, there's sun here. He goes, I know, last six weeks. Has it happened since 1975? i like, you know. You never see the sun when you know the last time you saw the sun was in 1975. Six weeks. I mean, I like for real, man. Everybody's like, everybody's like crazy. They're happy. They're like, they're like skipping. I mean, it's like 70. If they're taking off their shirt, laying out, I'm like, whoa, man, get a tan. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's because because you know, you know that that stuff messes with your emotions. Right? Our emotions can be caused by terrible circumstances. I'm not denying that some of us are facing some challenges. I'm not denying that you're going through some stuff. But your emotions, watch me, or feelings are not meant to be, to be uh, things that you are led by. 
They're not meant to lead you or guide you, but to inform you. Listen to me. Your feelings or emotions should not be dictators, but indicators. They, 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 they're, they're indicators. They inform you of what may be happening in your life. But they should not lead and guide your life. You're going to feel anxiety. You're going to feel worry. You're going to feel worry. You're going to feel things at a certain time. But just because you feel it does not mean that you have to do it. Let me say it to you this way. If I was in America, so I don't know if it translates. But in America, we have people, myself included, feel road rage. Do you know what road rage is? Has anybody ever felt road rage here? Let me see your hand. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Or you're not driving yet. Your mama's still driving you. Grow up, son. Get a license. Has anybody ever felt road rage? Come on right now, right? Now, if you are honest with me and you felt road rage, most of the time you didn't act out on it. I mean, when I feel road rage, it's like, you just cut me off. Like, oh, you know who I am. My family will we'll, we'll hurt you, will drive by you. Don't let the skinny jeans fool you. I can handle myself. No, no, no. Now, my wife will tell you, I, 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 at, at times, and I, I hate to admit it, but I feel road rage at least once every day. My wife can see when it comes on me. She begins to pray in tongues. Don't do it. And most of the time when we feel it, right, road rage, we don't become it. It should be practical. How many of you ever felt like slapping somebody because they got you so mad? Come on, wave your hand. Oh, now you're feeling me now, huh? Have you ever just felt like, just like, what? Yeah, you know, just, I can't believe that. Now, some of you are too safe. You don't, you don't respond to anything. I have felt that as a pastor with people in my church. People come up and tell pastors stuff they never tell anybody else. Like, people come up to me like, whoa, pastor, you look really tired. I'm like, I want to say, well, you look ugly yourself. I just want to tell you that right now. One person came up and said, yeah, wow, you're so skinny. You should probably start working out. I want to say, well, you're so fat. <laughs> Just because you feel it, come on, doesn't mean, right, you, you don't have to become it. I mean, just, just think about the things that pop into your mind you don't let out of your mouth. <laughs> I got one brother right there that's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I mean, this, this, is, this is reality, like, 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 okay. How many wanted to give somebody a piece of your mind one time? Just, you just wanted to just drop a few on somebody. Come on now. I mean, you want to start rapping. You know what I'm saying? Just, just but, but you don't do it. So watch, because instinctively we say, even though I feel it, I don't have to become it. See, Jesus isn't saying, don't feel it. He says, don't become it. You are not what you feel. Come on, champions. You are what you decide. i say that again because I, I feel like, I know it's the first one, but I feel like preaching. You are not what you feel. You are what you decide. I, I make a decision. I, I decide by the grace of God. I decide by the power of God that I'm not going to be that. You don't know my background. You don't know where I come from. My wife does. Why should I be sitting, standing on a platform, one of the greatest churches in England? Why do I preach at some of the greatest places in America? My wife says, don't drop names, so I don't drop names, but, but Joel, how can I? Well, why do I get to preach for a guy like Bishop? I didn't drop his name. Why do I get to preach at some of the great? And my dad is not a preacher. I don't come from a list of preachers. I'm the first Christian in my family. The first one. Thank God for Wendy and her brother and, and, and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. Seven generations of preachers. I come from seven generations of pagans. And I, I, don't, I don't despise how people have a head start in their life. But if you knew where I grew up and you knew where I came from and you knew what God did and you know the grace of God, I'm here to tell you, my friends, it doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you end up. I feel like preaching this right now. Well, you don't know. 
You don't know. You're just for a minute. You don't know my circumstances. You don't know. One guy was telling me this. He said, he said, you know, Pastor, you don't know. You know what my therapist is telling me? What's your therapist telling me? Well, you know, your, 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 your mother and your father, they're alcoholics or, and they're drug addicts. And you're going to have a propensity because your father is this way. And I stopped the person. I said, stop. Thank God for counselors and therapists. But the problem with that one is they're comparing you to the wrong father. And I just say that. If any man or woman be in Christ here in new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are a new creation. You got a new father. You got a new destiny. You got a new purpose. Come on, champions. You don't know what you feel, but what you decide. Life is about deciding what you really choose to believe. People used to say this when I was growing up, and they're saying, well, the Bible, you know, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That is not even true. You say, oh, I want to say amen, but then you say it's not true. <laughs> no, because it's not true. Because we, we want to insert ourselves as if we validate the truth. God said it. That settles it, Period. You could be an agnostic, and we welcome you. You could be an atheist, we welcome you. You could be any belief system, we welcome you. And you don't have to watch me now to believe to belong. Just come as you are. But we got to take ourselves out of the equation. God said it, that settles it. So the question must be asked. Then if I believe it, what happens? When I believe the word of God, it does not become true. It already is. It becomes transformational. God, help me with this one. God's word is true whether you believe it or not. But when you believe it, it becomes transformational. That's why the writer says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So as I begin to believe the word of God, it became transformational in my life. It's not what, watch me, what I feel. It's what I decide to really believe. I believe God is for me, not against me. I believe that I'm saved by the grace of God, not by my efforts or my works. Life is about what I'm really thinking. Right thinking leads to right living. That's so good. I can amen myself right now. My God, I'm so good today. <laughs> Listen to me. He says, so, 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 okay, if it, so, so what about my feelings? Let me, let me help you with that. Whatever we focus on, we feel. I'm going I'm to help change your life. Whatever we focus on, we feel. Let me say it to you this way. If you want to feel bitter and angry, I would ask you right now to think about a person or a circumstance right now. And you could feel bitter and angry. Somebody messed you around. Somebody left you. Somebody hurt you. Somebody betrayed you. Come on. That ex walked out on you. You're still thinking about him when he's wrecked five other girls' lives. And you still think. If you want to feel happy right now, think about that moment. Was it a birthday? Maybe you had an accomplishment. Maybe something. And if you stop and think about a person that brings happiness into your you can actually feel happy. How about feeling proud? Nothing wrong with that. How, man, you, you did a great accomplishment. You got that degree. You got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. You finished that, that race. You, you did something that nobody said you could do. And if you start thinking about your accomplishments, come on, you feel proud. See, what you focus on, come on, is what you feel. See, that's why recently I was doing some study, and uh, there were some recent tests that were doing on people that have clinical depression. And uh, they're on meds, and, and I'm not against meds. I'm not against that. I, I don't say just throw everything out. But, but what they decided to do is, is like, okay, what can we do to help these people? So what they did is they told these people, they said, what you need to do is we're going to give you another prescription. The prescription is we want you to smile, an exaggerated smile, 20 minutes every day. Not a smile, an exaggerated one. Like my friend Chad Veach. Yes, uh, I... <laughs> what they found is after a few months, 80% of the people came out of clinical depression. 
Now, 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 let me give you another study, right? This is crazy. So this is interesting to me. So a doctor, he did this, uh, uh, this research, and he found out something. That when you smile, your brain does not stop to think if it's, for, if it's real or not. Your brain says the face, the muscles, everything is expressing a smile. Now, you could be faking the smile, but your brain doesn't stop to choose is it real or fake. So what it does is it releases dopamine and serotonin in your body based upon what it senses in your face. That's why the Bible says that we go from glory to glory as we behold him. See, as you, ah, God, help me. as God, I go, oh, Jesus, help me. <laughs> Here's what happens. Is when you come into the presence of God and we say, come on, lift your hands in worship. What we're telling you is get your eyes off yourself. Put your eyes on someone that is greater. And here's the pushback that I get in America. Well, I don't feel like worshiping. I didn't ask you if you felt like it. I didn't ask you if you felt. I said, this Bible says that everything had breath. Come on, praise the Lord. See, the Bible says, I wish everyone, Paul writes, that everyone would lift up holy hands, come on, with the wrath or doubting. There's something, that's why it's called faith. Faith is, I don't feel it. I don't act in my feelings. I don't be led by my feelings. I'm led by the word. I'm led by the spirit. I am led by what God says. I may feel it, but I'm not going to become it. I may feel worry. I may feel anxiety, but I will not become it. I may feel it, but I don't Why do you have to be so emotional about it? Because I feel it. What you focus on is what you feel. How about this? You say, well, what about my feelings? Well, what about the questions we ask? If we ask, the, ask a bad question, we'll get a bad answer. Some of us, we, we just ask the wrong questions. Like, how come that person doesn't like me? Wrong question. Who knows? They're emo. Who knows? <laughs> if you don't like my preaching, I don't know. I, well, well, I don't know why you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm one of the greatest communicators on the planet. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> no, can I tell you? We ask the wrong question all the time. And instead of saying, how come that person doesn't like me? You need to ask a better question. God, what do you think about me? Yeah. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, thank you, Lord. What shall separate me from the love of God? Nothing shall separate me from the... If you ask the right question, you get the right answer. See, the enemy wants you always to ask the wrong question. That's why he came in the Garden of Eden, and he got Adam and Eve to ask the wrong question. Because if he gets you asked the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. How many of us spend our life asking questions that give us the wrong answers because we're asking the wrong question? Do not worry. Do not be anxious. <laughs> Jesus is so practical because he goes, oh, by the way, if you live your life that way, is it going to add anything to your life or take it away? He says, you can't add anything to your life if you worry about it. Jesus is a master of misdirection. Jesus didn't deny reality. He redefined it. So what does Jesus do? Most of us, if we become worry and fears because we're all into us, how am I going to get out of this? What am I going to do? How am I going to make this happen? How am I going to, 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 that's why you're a terrible God, because you don't have ability to deliver yourself. So what does Jesus do? And the band could come up because I know the drill. <laughs> come on, guys. Sorry. I know it's a good sign we're ending. They always have to send backup. They don't just send one. If you know my preaching, they don't send one keyboard. They send everybody. Like, we got, we got to make this guy stop, you know. I come from a gang area. You don't get it, but if you did, you understand what I mean. You never go by yourself, especially if you're Mexican. You always show up with 10 guys. 
I was about to say something, but I don't know you that well, so we'll stop. No, you don't want me to say it. Just because I think it doesn't mean I have to say it. Just because I feel it doesn't mean I have to do it. Start the five minutes so I can get it done. Thank you. Appreciate that. Jesus goes on to say, he says, uh, let me help you a little bit. He says, look at the birds. Get your eyes off yourself. Look at the flowers. And, and notice the text. If your heavenly father, not theirs, yours. Emphasis in the Greek. Yours. Repetitive. Yours never changing. Yours cannot shift. If your Heavenly Father takes care of them and takes care of the flowers, won't He take care of you? Are you not more valuable than they? So what, what does Jesus do? He points us and lets us know that now we have a Heavenly Father and let me retranslate it. He's basically saying, your dad's got it. Your dad's got it. Trust me, he's got it. He, he just got it, man. He, he's got it. If Jesus was Mexican, orale, he got it. He's got it. And then, and then he goes, oh, and let me just, let me give you one more just to help you. <laughs> you got a heavenly father, which means you're in another family. See, where I grew up, we're family. Like, when we're family, we're family. Like, like I have friends for over 30 years. We're family. And even though my, my family, you know that who can get you the most mad is your family. That's why you got to stay in church. If this is your family, your community, you're going to get ticked off. Even in Champions Church, where we're all champions. But some of you act like chumps sometimes. You know what I'm talking about. No, let's be honest. Nobody can get me more mad than my wife sometimes. She knows how to push my buttons. I know how to push her, certainly. No, listen to me, but we don't just, I'm done. And we got to learn that we're in the family of God. And there's grace. Come on, there's mercy. Come on, there's forgiveness in the family. You, you're a new family. Watch, I got to end. Not only that, he says, he says, listen, you got a father, which means you're a new family. He, but it gets even better. He says, oh, by the way, you're in another kingdom. You're in the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of God is, with him, all things are possible. The kingdom of God is, if God be for me, come on, who can be against me? The kingdom of God is, I'm not going to focus on the right now. All I know is that God is going to cause all things to work together for my good. I'm not, I'm not going to live in the temporal. I'm not going to live right now. I feel like preaching. I, I, just, I just want you to hear me. I am concerned what's happening to me now. But God would never have started something in my life if he has not already completed it. Let me help you in the last two minutes that I have. Right? Listen to me. Here's how we do life, sir. Here's how we do life. I want to talk to you for a second because you look like you're into it. We start something hoping we could finish it. Because we live linear in time. Are you, are you tracking with me? We live linear. We go from point A to point Z. That's not how God works. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. What God does is, I know the end from the beginning. So God says, I already know Z, so I start at A. What does that mean? That means if God has started something, that means He's already accomplished it. That means it's done. So if, if God has started anything in your life, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, Joseph sold into slavery in a pit, traded, betrayed by Potiphar's wife. Didn't look like it's going to come to pass, but he didn't get bitter. He didn't get angry because the Bible says that the Lord was with him. And as long as God is with him and he's with you and with me, God caused everything to work together. That's why we get this famous scripture, what you meant for evil. God turned around for good. I'm going to pray for somebody right now. You're in this place right now. You see, you know what, Benny Perez, I got to be honest with you. I deal with anxiety. I deal with worry. I recently preached this message to my church. 75% of the people responded. Some of them were my pastors and my leaders. 
because there's no condemnation because they realized I'm feeling it but I don't have to become it I'm not saying you're not gonna the feeling is gonna go away I'm saying you don't have to become it in Jesus name but you want me to pray for you it'll take me just 10 seconds are you ready if that's you and, and you're gonna be bold say that's me Benny one two and three shoot shoot, shoot to your feet right now come on you, you're dealing with it. come on just be honest come on you're dealing with it come on you're dealing with it. you're just dealing with it don't, don't I'm serious because I, I sense this I said to my wife what should I preach and I went to prayer I had like three different messages in fact I may preach a different one the next one you should come back get yourself a coffee and come back in fact I'm feeling so good we're gonna have a service tonight at six o'clock we're just gonna go no we have three people yes we'll have a little Bible study lift your hands towards heaven I want to pray for you you're standing Woo! this church is filled with worried people look at this Come on, lift your hands towards heaven. Come on, lift your hands. Pretend you won the World Cup. Come on, lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're a heavenly Father. And I declare and decree that, Lord, if you took care of the birds, you take care of the flowers, you're taking care of us. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I break every spirit of fear and worry and anxiety off you. I say you're going to live and not die. You spirit of suicide, get away in the name of Jesus. Those thoughts of not living anymore, get away in the name of Jesus. We are children of the Most High God, and our dad's got it. And we declare that right now in the noble of the Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said a big amen. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast from Champions. If this message has impacted your life, we'd love to hear about it. You can send us your story to info at championschurch.org.uk. Also, why not take a moment to subscribe to our podcast so you can hear more great messages just like this.